Okay, so before we get to the trouble, and every time I say that, I think of the old, uh, the, uh, the, um, the old movie where we got trouble, trouble right here in River City. You guys remember yeah, Trouble that starts with the Yeah, it starts with and the and the pool. Yeah. Um, so before we get into the trouble, let's talk about the good times. All right. And I, I, and I haven't prepped anybody, so hopefully moms, you pull me out of this. As well as uh, any of you here who um, remember your mother and there's something you want to share about them, you can do that too. So you don't have to be a mom to share during this time, but how your mother impacted your life. Or a mom, how you how being a mother has impacted your life as well. The good things. Okay, so we're going to open it up to the floor, and you're going to yell out some things that first mothers that you really enjoy about being a mother. Then you know, no sermons, but just something short. It's going to be a quiet floor. Mothers, why do you why do you love being a mother? Because my kids have kids, and so do their kids. <laughs> yeah, all right. Are you talking grandchildren here? Great, great grandchildren. <laughs> I didn't allow the non-mothers to speak, so I guess Dale, that's good. Anybody else? All right, good. You're awesome. Any other moms? And then we'll open it up to everybody. Any, any moms here? You want to say why you think being a mother is so awesome? Yeah. Maybe a better person. A better person. Okay. Other moms? Just to feed on, stretch me beyond myself. Stretch you beyond yourself, okay. <laughs> yes, well they go there and then the back. Because my mother, because my kids are following the Lord. Your kids are following the Lord, okay. Yes, and? Okay, yeah. pride, yes. Mm -hmm. Right on. Okay, any other moms? You want to share about why it's awesome being a mom? Yes. Right on. Super. Okay. Awesome to be a mom. That's what I want to hear. Okay, now anybody, what is it? What was so great about your mom growing up? Think of something. Your passion. She didn't kill me. <laughs> <laughs> That's very merciful of her. Right? Uh, my uh, birth mother wasn't worth anything, but my fo foster mother took me in and loved me like her own, and she set me on the path to following Christ. Okay, Amen. awesome. Good. Good guidance. Someone else? Your mom? How does she impact you? Endlessly loving and encouraging you, brought us no matter who is waiting special life, she always brought us. Right on. Endlessly. Very good. Okay. I'll say the same. Four boys in the family. Okay. Lots of patience for a voice. Yeah. Right on. Then? I have to say the same. My mom led me to Christ when I turned towards darkness many years ago. And I thank her so much for that. And I thank you. A mom's influence to bring someone to faith. Yes. Okay, good. All right. And one more. Your mom? Something great about my mother. She had eyes in the back of her head. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that standard equipment for mothers? Yep. I think so. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. Now, now, now we turn to the, the trouble. We got the good, now we got the trouble. So what I thought is, you know, sometimes kids have a knack of just bringing trouble with them. And other times they have a knack of trouble just attracts to them. So I'm thinking if, if kids are bringing it with them, you, you might want to consider this commercial that I'm going to show you. So go ahead and watch it. It's a sponsor. Last part, uh, it said the, the screamer is not responsible, oh, the user is responsible for the use of this product. The screamer is not responsible for permanent emotional damage, future therapy, or jail time. <laughs> Exodus, chapter 2. A very famous mom is the mother of Moses. Verse 1 says, Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she, she, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister 
stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she said. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter. He became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Let's pray. Dear God, we ask for your spirit to be strong in this service, especially on the moms today. You have given them a great job, and we ask that you be ever close to them. Give them your wisdom, strength, and the faith to handle anything they are experiencing as moms. And allow them to know that with you, all things are possible. Bless this time in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So what was this trouble? I think you probably have surmised what it is already. The trouble was that the Pharaoh wanted all of the babies to be killed. Why? Because he was noticing that their numbers were increasing. Moses' name means drawn out of the water. For her and Moses... Trouble began right at the beginning of their existence. They're in captivity, and the orders from verse chapter 1, 15 to 22 were the following. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill he, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went, what am I talking about? This is the wrong chapter. There we go. But now, because he can't flee, he's a baby. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose Names were Shifa and Pua. When you were helping the Hebrew women during uh, childbirth on the delivery school, if you see that the baby is a, is a boy, kill him. But if it was a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? And the midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so the problem was that, that, that the, the king of Egypt had seen that all of a sudden God was blessing his people even in captivity. That shows us the power of God. No matter what the circumstances, God can do amazing things. So two things. You want to get rid of the uh, people, the babies, and also it was kind of a sweet backdoor sacrificing to the Nile because the Nile was the god of Egypt. So he kind of went on both those areas. Two, but the love of the mother overrides such an order, and there's no way that Moses' mom would have taken the life of her fine child. Unconditional love. I believe there is no other place in the world you can find more unconditional love than in the heart of a mom. Amen. And as moms love their children, they see the love of God through a mom. Now, I'm not setting you ladies up on a pedestal. But what I am saying is that God has put in you something so special that as she looked at her child, she grew into great love with that child. And isn't that true? When those children are born, I was there for the birth of both my kids, but I wasn't as close as Del. And uh, I could see the love for my kids and my wife. She just met them. Like, they just came out. Like, there they were. And she immediately fell deep in love with my kids. The love of a mom overrides the things of the world. The third thing we see here is she wanted to do the right thing in God's eyes. And that's the most important part today. And I believe that's very important. What the world says to do, if God says don't do it, we don't do it. Mothers need to stand. I believe I've met a lot of ladies and moms who have a backbone that would stand up to anything and anyone. And that's what we need today in our mothers. That's what our children need. 
They need moms that not only stand up for what they believe, but they will stand alone if they need to. I love that. They're not like uh, Egyptian women. They, were, they have their babies and they go. No longer 20, 30 hour labors. Like, let's do this. It's done. We're out of here. Clean up the mess. We're on to another job. Strong like bull. <laughs> and, and, and you know, the Pharaoh accepted that. And it's, and it's so cool the way that God even honored the midwives and gave them blessings. Someone has written, when things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high and you want to smile, but you have to sigh. When care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Life is weird and it twists and turns as every one of us sometimes learns and many a failure turns about when he might have won had he stuck it out. Don't give up. Though the pace seems slow, you might succeed with another blow. Often the goal is nearer than it seems to a faint and faltering man. Often the struggler has given up and he might have captured the victor's cup. And he learned too late when the night slipped down how close he was to the golden crown. Moms, I believe that God is saying today, don't give up on your kids. Don't give up. There may be physical things that they're going through, don't give up. There may be psychological, emotional things that they have to go through, don't give up. There are spiritual battles for your children. Are you willing to give your children over to the enemy? Are you willing to stand in the gap? There's trouble in this world. Jesus said it would be full of trouble. And if you decide to have children in this world today, you're going to have a double heap of trouble. But God is the victor. He will take you through. And you need to remember to stick to it. Don't give up. No matter how bad it gets. Don't give up. Even if they say to you, I hate your guts. You say, that's fine. But I love you. And someday, they'll come around. Amen. God is, God is Amen. So if you got trouble, join the club. You're not the only one. But God is able to get you through. Number two, the trouble that causes her to act wisely. Not all of us have this kind of frontal trouble, but she definitely had this trouble. Verses three and four. The Bible says that we are to ask God for wisdom, and I believe that a mother should be bathed in wisdom every second of her life. Because she's going to be asked those hard questions, she's going to ask those questions that she's not feeling at the moment she wants to answer, but God somehow gives you wisdom, and you're not alone. God says in James, he says, I love this verse, if you lack wisdom, he will give it to us liberally. That means overflowing, more than what we need. And your kids will look back and say, wow. My mother was a Proverbs 31 mother. She was wise in all her ways. And even though I gave her all those gray hairs, she earned them because she was wise. And I believe the reason that moms can be wise today is because of God in their life. Number one, led her to a wise deduction. All right, there's an edict down that says, kill all of the Hebrew babies. Where would I hide my baby that no Egyptian would ever look for them? Bing! In the Nile! <laughs> Who'd look for a Hebrew baby in the Nile? Wow! That's God! I'd never think of that. I'd find some place somewhere in the house, some closet I could barricade, something, but in the Nile! So God already begins to answer her prayers, and he gives her the wisdom to know what to do. How about wisdom for protection for Moses? In verse 3, she went to the store, she got this basket of papyrus, and she began to tar and pitch it, tar and pitch it, tar and pitch it. So that she knew if she's going to put that baby in the Nile, she's going to make sure that baby's protected. And so she did the best craft job you've ever seen. That baby, that float boat could probably float forever. And she waterproofs it, and she puts it in the Nile. The third thing, God gives her wisdom as to location. Where do you put your baby... When there's crocodiles in the Nile. Now, these crocodiles, I did some research, 
They are the second largest crocodiles in the world that live in the Nile. They not only attack people, but they attack animals that are larger than, than themselves. They've even been known to attack rhinos. And they have these teeth that, that are somewhat crooked. And when they get into you, you, can, you it's almost impossible to get them out. So once they can grab you with their, and, and you'll be, let's say you're standing at the shore, what happened was that they would always take their baths in the bulrushes. You never take your bath out in the open because one second, there's no crocodile. Next second, you're in a crocodile's mouth. And they would drag you from the land and they would pull you under the water. And that's how a crocodile would also, it wouldn't just be the bite. It'd be the fact that they would drag you under the water and they would keep you there until you drown. So these crocodiles were pretty crazy. So God gave her wisdom. Where do you put the baby in, in the basket? Put him in the bulrushes. Because crocodiles do not like other things in the water with them. They like clear water. So you put these bulrushes that are coming out of the water and they won't go in there. And she thought, ah, thank you, God. I put my baby in the basket in the bulrushes. And then God gave her wisdom in regards to the timing. She wouldn't do it early in the morning. She would do it late at night because people would come to the Nile, take their baths in the Nile, and they would also wash their clothes when it was coolest in the night. So she kept her baby until the right time and then she put him in just around that time. Now the fifth thing, verse 4, she gave her an ability to observe. Who she thought might be open to a cute little baby. For some reason, she thought about the Pharaoh's daughter. And she knew at a certain time, the Pharaoh's daughter came down to the Nile to take her bath. Thus, God had gave her wisdom, and we'll find out a little later what happens. Moms today need wisdom. They need wisdom to know who their children should hang out with and who they shouldn't hang out with. The crocs of this world, so to speak. Wisdom to step back and look at the full picture. Am I running in too soon, or should I wait? Because if I run in too soon, I push my kids towards the thing that they are, it's trouble. But maybe I wait till later, I ask God to help me to know when is the appropriate time so that my children will somehow see the trouble and they turn to me and ask for trouble, ask for help. And I can rush in. I can say, no, honey, that's, that's not what you need to do. Come with me. So God gives us wisdom. Timing, oftentimes in wisdom, is the most important thing. A mother today needs to place her children in the Nile of the world but make sure they are protected when they're in that Nile. Jesus said something similar. He didn't use the word Nile. He said, Lord, my disciples do not take the Nile of the world, but in the world, help them. And like it or not, your children are in the Nile of the world, moms. But you can do all you can to make sure that when they enter that Nile, they know exactly who the predators are. They know how to survive. And they know that God is there with them through that process and that you were there for them as well. Being a mom is not an easy job, from my humble observation. But it's a job that you've been called to. You need to respond to. I heard about a mom, Raja, a week ago. And during World War II, she was living in Lithuania. And the Nazis came and they took her and her daughter, her eight-year-old daughter, she was in their custody for three years in Nazi camps, concentration camps. And through those three years, she protected her daughter that not one German soldier touched her daughter. Through that time, they had to stand for 24 hours at a time at attention. The Germans, the Nazis, believed that this way they'd be able to, if someone fell over, they said they'd be weak and they would shoot them. For three years, she protected her daughter and at the age of 11, they walked out of the concentration camps. And through the entire time, that mother protected her daughter to the point of one time she even uh, made her dress like a, a man so that when the Nazi soldiers came in for the girls, they passed over her. A wise mom, a loving mom, a mom who's able to take care of her daughter even during that most terrible time in the history of the world. 
The third thing we see, the trouble that causes her faith to grow. Now, when all these things happen, when trouble comes into our life, all of a sudden, we have two options. We can say, oh, I give up. Or we can say, God, grow my faith. And that's really why God allows trouble to come into our lives, so that our faith will grow. Faith is like a muscle. Unless used, it will soon diminish. And Jacobin, Moses' mom, needed to believe that God was going to do something to save Moses. Because he was such a fair-looking baby. A baby set from God. A gift. Romans 1.17 says, The righteous live by faith. 2 Corinthians 5.7, For we live by faith and not by sight. 1 Timothy 6.12 says, Fight the good fight of faith, moms. Hebrews 1.11 says, Now faith is the confidence of what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. Mothers, you need faith. I think of my own mom. I think of the faith when the first time that she saw me drive off in the car all by myself. And I'm sure she's just going, oh, Lord, help him. I know you can. It's a scary thing. The first time she, she saw me drive off to Bible college, I was in Michigan. I drove all the way to Edmonton. I'd never really even been out of my state. It was scary for her and scary for me. I remember I looked back and I saw her crying in my dad's arms. But my mom was a, a lady of faith. And she knew that God was calling me to Edmonton to start Bible college and seminary. Faith. It's tough. But faith is something that all moms need to have. Number one, faith about the events. Placing the baby in the Nile. Faith that God was sent the right person. Faith. Do you exercise your faith? Do you pray over your kids? I remember Del and I, in the earlier years, we'd stand over our son and daughter's cribs, and we would say, God, we have the faith that you're going to provide for them, and we pray that right now you would prepare their spouse, nine months old, that, that this person would be prepared for them. That's faith. Faith to step out and ask those things. Faith about people, verse 5. People are so unpredictable. Moses' mom was hoping to get Pharaoh's daughter. Who would she get? And God, through his providence, allowed her faith to be honored. And just the right person at the right time came along and rescued her son. Faith about feelings. How would these people feel when they saw this Hebrew baby? Clearly a distinction from the Egyptian babies. And yet, the first sight of Moses, there was empathy. The baby was crying. How can you not like a crying baby? So cute. Oh, the baby's crying. Oh. Faith about favor. Not only did the Pharaoh's daughter have sympathy, but later on she says, bring the baby back to me. And through the process, she raises Moses. I love that part where it says, take the baby to the Hebrew lady and I will pay you. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Wouldn't that be great if moms, I will, I will pay you. Now I know mothers do not want pay. I mean, uh, that's pretty clear. But, but if you did get paid, that'd be awesome. Like, so cool. But we won't talk about that because that's not even the concern. Faith in God. Protect our children. To make sure that each one of them has the faith that we have. In USA Today in 1990, adults asked the question, who was the greatest influencer in your life? Expecting the answer to be teachers, professors. 43% of men said their mother. 53% of women said their mother. The influence on children is strong. And sometimes, mom, you may think that you have no influence at all. But just your presence of constant love and unconditional uh, love to these your children sends a message. You need to make sure that that message is sent once again. The last thing, the trouble that made her available for God's plan, availability. Jochebed's availability to God was in the midst of great trouble. Mothers serve when others have long time given up. Ephesians 6, 7 says, serve wholeheartedly. As if you were serving the Lord, not people. Galatians 5.13, someone uh, love, serve one another in love. 
Mothers are the most selfless servants there are. A mother is able to give and give and give and give and give. Jochebed was available to serve God. She had been called to a great task. And yet it seemed like it was hopeless. They were in captivity. They had no power. But yet they did because God was there with them. And I believe that Jacob, that Jacob, Jochebed served God because she had a deep-rooted faith. And this is something I think is so important for moms, that you need to work on your own faith before you communicate that faith to your kids. For what is in the well cannot be communicated if the well is empty or brought to the kids. And we see her background that uh, her and her husband, Amram, were from the Levite tribe. That Jochebed was, was a Levite and a descendant of the Levites. And that through her growing up years and through her parents, they established a deep faith in her, in God. Now you may say, Pastor Jim, well, I didn't have that. Well, it's still possible for you to have that deep faith, Amen. even now. Yes. That you can't say, well, I didn't have that, therefore I, I can't have You can. Yes. And God knows where you're at. But she had that, and she drew upon that. And there are times in your life when you feel like, oh, there's nothing I can do. There is. And when it comes to your kids, there is. Because it's not you doing it, but God through you doing something in their life. Don't give up, because God never gives up on us. His love is unconditional. Ephesians 6.14 it says in, it instructs the parents not to provoke their children, but to train them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And it gets specific. The word nurture is the word padia, and it pertains to training and teaching children about God. So when you're in the car, you listen to those cassettes. Uh, they're not cassettes anymore. You listen to those DVDs or CDs or whatever they're called in the car. I just listen to the radio. But in, in training is there, it's always at nighttime, you read of a story that's pertinent to your faith. You always talk about your life and how God is moving and how you got answered prayers and you begin the process of nurturing them. And admonition is something, it's a nothia, and it means to draw attention to something through a mild rebuke or warning. It just doesn't stop here, but it, the teaching part, but there's also the correcting part. And we know that kids need correcting, right? They, every day of their life, because they're kids. They, they don't know what we know. They don't have the life experience that we have. And God uses that not only to teach them what is right, but when they get it wrong, we turn them to make it right again. That's what that uh, nurturing is all about, and that instruction. And the two together causes a mother to be a powerful force in the life of their kids because they get their faith right from you. Right from you. And, and, and probably it happens more from the moms than the dads, which, you know, the moms maybe spend more time with their kids. But it's, it's a team effort if there are two. But definitely for the moms, it's important that they have this time with their kids and they don't overstep those things by, by not saying something, but they always are available for the kids. The second thing, Jochebed was available to serve Moses. Proverbs 22.6 it says, start your children off in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. It's a promise that we have that if we put these things in our kids, then our kids will turn out to be those that honor God, and through that process, they will honor us, or uh, moms, because of what they've done in their life. <coughs> Nothing can replace a mother in the life of their children. As we instruct them, as we play that, plant that seed in them, God gives it growth, and that we see the remnants of those things that we have done for God. And the third thing, Jacob had served the nation of Israel. Her influence on Moses was that she developed a leader of integrity. A leader who loved his people. A leader who listened. And a leader who had a respect and love for God, for the God of the Hebrews. Do you know God has a plan for your children? I really believe that. There's no child born that God does not have a plan for them. And I believe that a lot of times moms are activators 
of those plans in children's lives. And you look back and you see how God has moved in the life of your child and God has used you. Mothers, you are so important in the life of your children. You may not see it now, but you will see it one day. And God will honor you for that. I have this one more uh, poem that someone wrote. It's up to you. One song can spark a moment. One flower can wake the dream. One tree can start a forest. And one bird can herald spring. One smile begins a friendship. One hand clasp lifts a soul. One star can guide a ship at sea. One word can frame the goal. One vote can change a nation. One sunbeam lights a room. One candle wipes out darkness. And one laugh will conquer gloom. One step must start each journey. And one word must start each prayer. One hope will raise our spirits and one touch can show you care. One voice can speak with wisdom. One heart can know what's true. One life can make the difference. You see, it's up to you. But don't feel the pressure or the load because God will help you in your mothering in the days to come. Got trouble? Think of Moses' mom. She got through it. So can you with the help of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity. I, I pray that every mom here today would be encouraged that they are not in this alone and that it is worth it to hang in there no matter what the circumstance because you have given each of them a very special present. A child or many children who need their love and attention. And Lord, as I Everybody's eyes are closed, their heads are bowed. Maybe the moms here today, you would just simply say, Pastor Jim, pray for me. Um, and just simply raise your hand and about a mothering issue, okay? I see that hand, great, super. All right, I see those hands. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. I would love to pray for you. Anybody else? There's something in your children's lives that you'd like us to pray about. I would love to bring that to the Lord before you. Okay, thank you. See those hands. Thank you, I see the hand back there. Anybody else? And Lord, I pray especially for the moms that have raised their hands. God, you know what the issue is. And you know that the part that the mom who raised their hands will play. But Lord, most of all, we give you the glory and you the honor. Because we know that you are a God who can do anything. Nothing is impossible for you. So we leave this place today putting everything in your hands. And we pray that you would give these moms a great rest of the day. And may their hearts be light. And may they realize how wonderful it is to be a mother. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. Happy Mother's Day. Please stay for, grab a carnation and a piece of cake. It's, it's uh, for all of us, but in honor of the moms. You're dismissed.